So let's start by Antonio Gramsci writing from Mussolini's prison cell, labor activist whose work was mostly involved in uh, worker-owned cell phone managed uh, workers' enterprises, left social theorist. Uh, he discussed how societies tend to develop ideas and beliefs that reflect and support the prevailing structure of power, uh, creating a framework of beliefs and attitudes that becomes what he called hegemonic common sense, something we don't question. Uh, we just take for granted uh, like uh, the air we breathe. Now that tendency has of course been recognized before, was a major thesis of uh, Marxist uh, thought, uh, had much deeper origins in modern thought. Uh, one of the most interesting is uh, David Hume, the great philosopher David Hume, 18th century. Uh, he wrote one of the first uh, major works in what we now call political science is on the principles of, on the first principles of government. And he opens it in the first paragraph by writing that I'll quote him, uh, says, we, he finds nothing more surprising than to see the easiness with which the many are governed by the few and to observe the implicit submission with which men resign their own sentiments and passions to those of their rulers. When we inquire by what means this wonder has brought about, we shall find that as force is always on the side of the governed, the governors have nothing to support them but opinion. It is therefore on opinion only that government is founded and this maxim extends to the most despotic, most military governments, as well as to the most free and most popular. It's uh, far more significant in the countries that are most free and most popular, where the art of what Walter Lippmann called manufacturing consent has reached its uh, apogee, its most sophisticated application since force, direct force is less available. Well, I think all of these thoughts merit careful attention. And it's very useful to consider what we take for granted as unquestionable common sense, what we consent to without reflection, uh, not just what we consent to, but what we often go on to regard as the highest goal of life. So in today's world, one of the highest goals in life is having a job. The best advice that one can give to a young person is to prepare to find employment. Now that is to prepare to spend your waking life in servitude to a master. Uh, for many, that means subordination to discipline that is far more extreme than in a totalitarian state. So Stalin, for example, had enormous control over his subjects, but he didn't have enough control to tell them that uh, at 3 p.m. you can take a bathroom break for a couple of minutes. Uh, Here's the clothes you have to wear all day. Uh, here's the way you have to behave when an unpleasant customer comes in. And in general, uh, this is how you have to live your life for most of your waking hours down to the last detail. Now, that's what's called uh, having a job. Well, all of this is quite apart from the ingenious means that have been developed and devised over the years to control the lives of the subjects uh, from 
Taylorism, its origins back in the 19th century, control every motion that a working person makes up to uh, the devices that are being made available by modern technology. Managers might keep an eye on the workforce. And now it is the uh, all seeing eye of some remote computer, uh, the major delivery services, UPS and others. Uh, and I'll describe how they are increasing efficiency thanks to the new techniques of surveillance means fewer drivers uh, achieving more and faster delivery. Uh, the method uh, of the new devices allow remote managers to find out if the driver stopped for a cup, a cup of coffee or backed up when he was, shouldn't have done it. So he can get an instant uh, notice of a demerit, uh, another one and you're fired. Uh, or uh, you can find out in seconds whether an Amazon warehouse worker takes the wrong path and wastes two seconds, let alone stops to talk to somebody. Demerit, next one, you're gone. And innumerable other examples that are all too familiar, not only in the precarious gig economy, but in one way or another through the whole system of renting oneself for survival, holding a job, one of the highest goals in life. Well, that may be hegemonic common sense today, but it certainly has not been in the past. From classical antiquity right through the 19th century, the idea of being dependent on the will and the domination of others was considered an intolerable attack on elementary rights and human dignity. The hegemonic common sense of today is very recent development, matter worth pondering. In fact, all of this seemed so obviously correct uh, that dependent on a, dependence on a master is intolerable so obviously correct that it was a slogan of Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party, which uh, regarded wage labor as differing from slavery only insofar as it was a temporary state until the person could gain freedom. But actually the most lively and eloquent and incisive condemnations and critiques were in the very vibrant uh, labor press of the early industrial revolution uh, written by working people, including what were called the factory girls, young women from the farms who were driven to the mills in the rising industrial system. Their writings are very much worth reading. They are available often in archival forms. Uh, the Journal of the Knights of Labor, the great multi multinational, multiracial, multiracial union of the uh, 19th century America, uh, held this main slogan that when a man is placed in a position where he is compelled to provide the benefits of his labor to another, he is in a condition of slavery. Uh, that was the standard assumption of working people, men and women, through the early years of the Industrial Revolution, right through the 19th century. One of the most articulate contributors to the working class protests against the reinstitution of a form of slavery in the rising industrial system, one of the most eloquent voices was the an itinerant mechanic, Thomas Skidmore, didn't have any formal education, but he was highly educated, uh, like many others at the time. He developed a serious critique of wage slavery, uh, founding it on the labor theory of value, 
as it had been developed by the classic economists, Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, with whose work he and others were familiar. And on that foundation, he defined slavery as, in his words, being compelled to labor while the proceeds of that labor is taken by others. And went on to argue at length that no matter how property rights are attained, they are illegitimate if they're used to make some dependent on others, allowing some to appropriate to themselves the labor of others. The general labor press extended and deepened these ideas. It was vocal and articulate. It condemned, um, quoting the Blastic inf blasting influence of monarchical principles on democratic soil, referring to the wage contract. Uh, workers recognized that this assault on basic human rights will not be overcome until those who, in their words, those who work in the mills will own them and sovereignty will return to producers. Then, quoting, working people will no longer be menials or the humble subjects of a foreign despot, an absentee owner, so that they will be slaves in the strictest sense of the word who toil for their masters. Rather, they will regain their citizens as free, their rights as status as free American citizens was recognized that the Industrial Revolution had introduced a crucial shift from price to wage. So when an artisan sells a product for a price, he retains his person. When he rents himself to a master, he sells himself. He loses his dignity as a person, becomes a wage slave in the terminology of the time. All of these ideas were very much alive, of course, after the formal abolition of chattel slavery. I stress formal because it was quickly reinstituted in 1877 as a new form of slavery, which lasted pretty much into the, to the 1930s and was the basis for the second uh, industrial revolution in the South. Um, legacy still remains. But in that context, the notion of wage slavery became very prominent. How is it different from chattel slavery? Well, uh, the idea that uh, productive enterprise should be owned by the workforce was pretty common coin all the way through the 19th century, and not just by Karl Marx and other left intellectuals, but also by the major exponents of classical liberalism. Uh, the idea was part of the classical liberal tradition of the time. Uh, one person who's brought this out eloquently in his recent work is David Ellerman and his studies of what he calls neo-abolitionism. He mentions John Stuart Mill the most prominent classical liberal figure of the 19th century, uh, one of the great modern intellectuals. Uh, Mill argued that, I'm quoting him, the form of association, which if mankind continues to improve, must be expected to predominate, is the association of the laborers themselves on terms of equality, collectively owning the capital with which they carry on their operations, working under managers electable and removable by themselves. In other words, democracy in the workplace. That's the form of association to which the human species will ascend if it continues to improve according to the doctrines of 19th century classical liberalism. It's a concept that has 
very solid roots in the ideas that animated classical liberal thought from its earliest days, from John, John Locke, Adam Smith, and others. Some of the most eloquent and forceful development of these ideas was in the writings of Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was one of the founding figures of classical liberalism, uh, uh, also the founder of the modern research university. His words are worth thinking about reading and thinking about carefully. Uh, they're far reaching in their import. Uh, Humboldt held that freedom is the necessary condition without which even the most soul satisfying occupation cannot produce any wholesome effects. Whatever task is not chosen by a man's free will, whatever constraints, whatever constrains or even guides him does not become part of his nature. It remains forever alien to him. If he performs it, he does it not with true humane energy, but with mere mechanical skill. Ideas, incidentally, which Humboldt also applied to the educational system in a manner which follows quite directly from the same thoughts. He went on to say that under the condition of freedom from external control, control all peasants and craftsmen can be transformed into artists. That is, people who love their craft for its own sake and refine it with their self-guided energy and inventiveness, and who in so doing cultivate their own intellectual energies, ennoble their character, and increase their enjoyments. This way, humanity would be ennobled by the very things which now, however beautiful they might be, degraded. This urge for self-realization is man's human, basic human need, need from childhood as distinct from mere animal needs. One who fails to recognize this ought justly to be suspected of failing to regard human nature as what it is and of wishing to turn men into machines. To determine whether the fundamental human rights are being honored we must consider not just what a person does, but the conditions under which he does it. Whether it is done under external control or spontaneously to fulfill a human need. If an artisan produces a beautiful work on command, we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is an instrument in the hands of others, not a free human being. Uh, Adam Smith uh, developed a very sharp critique of division of labor, not what he's famous for. In fact, it's interesting that in the bicentennial edition, the Chicago edition of Adam Smith, the scholarly edition, there isn't even an index entry for Smith's sharp critique of division of labor, but it's there and it's founded on the same principles. Uh, Smith argued that a person who performs the same task over and over on command will become as stupid and ignorant as a human being can be, an outcome that must be prevented by government action in any civilized society. Only work that is freely undertaken, using and enhancing one's own creative powers is an acceptable social condition. And that's the foundation of classical liberal thought. It's a very short step from these principles to the idea of control of all institutions, all communities within a framework of free association, 
federal free uh, organization through uh, agreed voluntary associations. Now that's the general style of very wide range of thought, including the main socialist traditions, the left uh, anti-Bolshevik Marxists, a much current activist work today of people seeking to gain control over their own lives and fate. The proliferation of worker-owned enterprises in the old Rust Belt in the United States, deindustrialized by neoliberal globalization in the interests of short-term profits of bankers and investors. Uh, spread of cooperatives, uh, localization of agriculture, and many other initiatives of mutual aid uh, with the long-term goal of creating the kind of cooperative commonwealth that was the explicit ideal of working people and farmers through the early industrial revolution. Uh, labor activists of the 19th century, late 19th century, warned of what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. Now, there have been massive efforts to instill this pernicious doctrine uh, in people's heads. Uh, the huge advertising and marketing industries spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year to achieve this goal much of intellectual culture and education is directed to it. And all quite consciously, if you read the press of the uh, highly class conscious business world, it warns of uh, what they call, quoting it now, the need to engage in the everlasting battle for the minds of men, to indoctrinate people with the capitalist story so deeply that they repeat it reflexively without thought. It should become common sense, mere common sense, to extol the merits of subordinating oneself to a master for one's waking life, to live a life of servitude to some foreign force. Uh, all of this was well understood by working people in the 19th century. In fact, workers in late 19th century New York warned that a day might come when wage slaves will so far forget what is due to manhood as to glory in a system forced on them by their necessity and in opposition to their feelings of independence and self-respect. They expressed their hope that that day would be far distant. In Gramscian terminology, they hoped to be able to block the efforts to, inst to instill a new hegemonic common sense in which workers would not only accept, but in fact glory in a system that turns them into menial and humble servants as they put it, wage slaves under tight control, abandoning their independence for the larger part of their lives. In Hume's earlier terms, they hope to present, prevent the imposition of the consent of the government that permits the masters to rule, whether in state or private government. Same ideas I should mention uh, relate to the general intellectual culture, not just the submission to a master for most of what's life. It's a topic that George Orwell wrote about it in suppressed work, work that you probably didn't read. Everyone has read Animal Farm, of course, but not very many people have read the introduction to Animal Farm which was not published, uh, was discovered in Orwell's papers uh, 30 years later. Uh, the, in the introduction to Animal Farm is directed to the people of England. It says this 
work is, of course, a satire on the totalitarian enemy. But the people of England shouldn't feel too self-righteous about it, because in free England, in his words, ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. His title of his work is called Literary Censorship in England, in Free England. And he gives a number of examples and a few sentences of explanation. And one reason, he says, is that the press is owned by wealthy men who have every reason to want certain ideas to be suppressed. But the second and more interesting idea is essentially Gramscian. Uh, if you've had a good education, you've gone to Oxford and Cambridge, you have instilled into you the understanding that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say. We can add, wouldn't do to think. That's manufacture of consent in the modern sophisticated term, the foundations of the liberal theories of democracy by Walter Lippmann, uh, Harold Laswell, founder of modern political science, all good Roosevelt, uh, Wilson, Roosevelt, Kennedy liberals, whose view was very much like that of the men who called themselves the men of best quality in the 18th century, the rabble, 17th century, the rabble have to be suppressed to none of their business to become involved in public affairs. They're too stupid and ignorant, as Reinhold Niebuhr put it. Therefore, they must, in his words, be controlled by necessary illusions and emotionally potent oversimplifications. As Lippmann put it in his progressive essays on democracy, uh, people have a function, namely to be spectators, but not participants. Their function is to show up every couple of years, push a lever uh, to pick one or another of us, the responsible men who have to be protected from the trampling and the roar of the bewildered herd. Now that's liberal, progressive, democratic theory in the modern period, traces far back to the suppression of the common people in the English Revolution, and in fact, to the US Constitution, which was, uh, the Constitution, of course, was written by a small number of wealthy men, mostly slave owners, who nobody else could spend a summer in Philadelphia in those days. And the uh, Constitution was, uh, actually its essence is captured in uh, the title of the leading scholarly work on the Constitutional Convention, uh, Michael Clarman's uh, book, a Harvard professor, called uh, The Framers' Coup, A Coup Against Democracy. The leading framer, James Madison, understood that the public had to be kept out of governing the country. They had to stop the threat of democracy that the public wanted. Well, therefore, there was a coup carried out by the framers to ensure that democracy wouldn't function. In Madison's design, power was primarily in the Senate, unelected, not elected till 20th century, uh, picked by elites. The Senate was to represent, as Madison put it, the wealth of the nation, those who recognize the rights of property owners and who understand that a prime goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Uh, that's the essence of the Constitution. Uh, in Madison's defense, we should say that he was basically pre-capitalist in mentality. He assumed that the wealthy men would be uh, the Roman gentlemen in the mythology of the day, uh, dedicated uh, to um, labor for the common good uh, with no self-interest. Should say that Adam Smith at the same time had a much sharper eye. Uh, Smith described the existing situation in words that we can easily translate into today. 
Well, he wrote in Wealth of Nations, 1776, that uh, the merchants and manufacturers of England are the masters of mankind, and they use their power to ensure to be, they become the principal architects of government policy, which they design to ensure that their own interests are very well attended to, no matter how grievous the impact on others, including the people of England, but of primarily those who are subject to what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans, referring particularly to the British uh, destruction and deindustrialization of India at the time. Uh, that was Adam Smith. Again, the terms are easily translatable today. I should say that it didn't take long for Madison to realize, to recognize the same truisms. In 1792, he wrote an eloquent letter to his friend Thomas Jefferson, uh, bemoaning the collapse of the experiment, quasi-democratic experiment that he had designed. He said, government has been Power has been taken over by the stock jobbers, Wall Street in our terms. The stock jobbers have become the tools and tyrants of government, uh, overwhelming government by their combinations and benefiting from government's largesse. Very easy to translate that into 21st century terms. Many things in one form or another remain constant, including bitter class war waged by the highly class conscious property owning capitalist classes. Well, uh, in sharp going back to the 19th century in very sharp reaction to these efforts to impose submission to the masters. There were very important rising movements of working people, radical farmers in uh, what was then, of course, largely an agrarian society. The farmers movements began in Texas, moved up to Kansas, Oklahoma, Midwest generally, included most of the farmers, that's most of the pop working population. They were, this is what was called the populist movement, not pop populism in the modern sense. This is traditional populism, radical democratic populism. Now they were dedicated to solidarity, mutual aid. They created the most significant uh, democratic movement in American history. Uh, farmers developed cooperative institutions, cooperative banks, support programs, distribution programs. They wanted to escape the control of Northeastern bankers and the capitalist control of distributors. They had a good deal of success. Also at the same time, that was true of workers in the industrializing Northeast. So in industrial areas of Western Pennsylvania, cities were run by democratically elected working class groups instituted policies leading towards the cooperative commonwealth that was their joint ideal. There were efforts to link the major labor movement, the Knights of Labor, and the radical farmers of the populist movements. And they were defeated, mostly by force and violence. The United States has an unusually violent labor history much worse than comparable countries it's to a very large extent a business run society with a very highly class conscious business class uh, but the battle is never over there are setbacks there's violent repression intense efforts to beat these ideas of independence and dignity and self-respect out of people's minds but the struggle goes on constantly 